10-month-old Lisa Irwin was kidnapped from her crib in the early hours of October 4, 2011, and her disappearance gained nationwide attention in the U.S. Local authorities in Kansas City and the FBI made huge efforts to find the little girl, but nothing related to her was found. However, as witnesses came forward, many strange events started to unfold about that night. Two neighbors, for example, saw a man carrying a baby close to the family's house, and then a large fire occurred in a nearby parking lot. Later, a similar-looking man was captured on CCTV walking next to a gas station. And finally, another witness reported a mysterious figure also carrying a baby in the vicinity of the interstate highway. Lisa Renee Irwin was born on November 11, 2010, in Independence, a satellite city of Kansas City, Missouri, to Jeremy Irwin and Deborah Bradley. The little girl also had two older stepbrothers, who were five and eight years old at the time of the events. The 10-month-old lived the stress-free and happy life of a baby in their green-colored house on North Lister Avenue, in the northern part of Kansas City, close to the 2,341-mile-long Missouri River. She had pretty blue eyes and short blonde hair. Her beloved show was Barney and Friends, and her parents called her Pumpkin Pie. She adored dancing and clapping her hands, listening to all kinds of music, and she could barely fall asleep without her pacifier. Lisa's favorite foods were bananas and spaghetti. She could already say words like mama and daddy, and she even gave her brothers the cute nickname Bubba. The baby could also greet with a friendly hi, express affection with I love you, and bid farewell with a sweet night-night. Her father, 28-year-old Jeremy worked as an electrician, while 25-year-old Deborah took care of the children at home. They lived in a peaceful street where pretty much everyone knew each other, and nothing out of the ordinary occurred before the disappearance. But on October 3, 2011, everything changed. It was a sunny Monday in the city of Fountains. The temperature reached a pleasant 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Jeremy returned home from his day job at 2.30 p.m., had a meal, and spent some time playing with the children. Three hours later, he left and worked late into the night on the remodeling of a nearby Starbucks, and he only got home between 3.30 and 4 a.m. on Tuesday. It was dark outside, as sunrise wasn't until 7.16, and the temperature dropped to a chilly 54 degrees Fahrenheit by then. The city was sleeping, and the streets were silent. Or maybe not entirely, because when he arrived at the family house, he found the front door unlocked, the screen door damaged, and the computer room window wide open while the lights were still on. It was strange because it had never happened before. In a normal situation, everything would have been turned off and locked while his fiancée and children were sleeping. The father wanted to check on the youngest child before going to bed, but when he entered the room, he was shocked to find that Lisa wasn't in her crib. He immediately woke Deborah up and started calling the baby's name, but unfortunately, there was no answer. We just got up and started screaming for her, looking everywhere, she wasn't there, the mother said. The parents called the police, and Deborah told them she last saw Lisa at around 10.30 p.m. while she was still in her crib. At 7.45 a.m., authorities activated the AMBER Alert, which stands for America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response. It is an early warning system that initially grew from community efforts when Dallas-Fort Worth broadcasters teamed up with local police in 1996 to help find abducted children. The Amber Alert is a legacy to nine-year-old Amber Hagerman, who was kidnapped while riding her bicycle in Arlington, Texas, and then brutally murdered. According to its website, other states and communities soon set up their own Amber plans, as the idea was adopted across the U.S. However, the alert was called off later that evening at 7 p.m., after it had served its purpose and successfully drawn the public's attention to the matter. At the time of the disappearance, Lisa was 30 inches tall, weighed about 28 pounds, and had a slight cold with a cough. She wore purple shorts and a purple shirt with pictures of white kittens. Her identifying features were a beauty mark on her right outer thigh and a small bug bite under her left ear. The infant had just two teeth at the bottom, but four more were on their way, and the family highlighted that the little girl wasn't shy and would go to most strangers. The vanishing of the baby caught nationwide media and public attention. 
more than a hundred state and federal police officers, along with firefighters, got involved in the initial investigation. A backpack containing used diapers and baby wipes in an empty house was discovered close to where Lisa went missing, and more used diapers were found in a nearby wooded area as well. They searched the nearby parks and canals extensively on foot and by horseback, but unfortunately, they didn't find anything related to Lisa Irwin. The family was very cooperative, and there were no gaps in their story. Captain Steve Young, leader of the investigation, said the day after the disappearance. The FBI also joined the search. Because of the unlocked front door, damaged screen door, and open window, their initial theory was that Lisa was abducted by a stranger who broke into the house. Their specialists interviewed the brothers for two hours about the evening, but the boys couldn't provide any useful information. But things start to become even more odd here. At first, the 25-year-old mother claimed that she had last checked on Lisa at 10.30 p.m. and went to sleep with her 5-year-old son and a stray cat she found that day. However, a week later, it was revealed that on the night Lisa went missing, Bradley had wine with Samantha Brando, a neighbor who brought her 4-year-old daughter over to play with Deborah's kids. It turned out she went to a festival food store shortly before 5 p.m. with her brother, Philip Nets and bought baby food along with a large five-liter box of Franzia white wine. The adults started drinking after baby Lisa was put to bed at 6.30 p.m., and the mother confessed to consuming enough to be drunk, reportedly between five and ten glasses of wine. Deborah eventually fell asleep at around 10.30 p.m., so later she could only say 6.30 for sure when she last saw her daughter. Worth noting that Samantha Brando stayed on the porch until 11.30 p.m., chatting with another neighbor, and didn't notice anything suspicious. After the parents realized their baby vanished, Jeremy hurried to Samantha's house next door, but the friend told him Lisa isn't there. Since the police couldn't find any undisputed evidence of abduction, they dispatched a cadaver dog to the house on October 19th, and surprisingly, the animal picked up the scent of a dead body near the mother's bed in the bedroom. There was no explanation for it, but since the house was constructed 63 years prior, Cindy Short, the lawyer for the parents, said that the finding might have been misleading because the scent could be decades old. My understanding is that there are cold cases where dogs have hit on scents of decomposition that have been in the home for as long as 28 years, she commented. But FBI agent Brad Garrett asserted the dog had a great accuracy record. In studies done of cadaver dogs where the dog has direct access to the scent and it's reasonably fresh, it's above 90%, he added. The positive hit was used to issue a warrant to carry out a more extensive 17-hour search. Investigators then performed a polygraph test on the mother, which they said she failed, although Deborah claimed she was never shown the results. Police even asked her if she killed Lisa, but she answered that she doesn't think alcohol changes a person enough to do something like that. The mother was by now the center of attention for the authorities, but they couldn't charge her without any evidence. It's important to note that Deborah consistently denied having any involvement in Lisa's disappearance, and she was afraid of being arrested because, according to her, if they arrest me, people are going to stop looking for her, and then I'll never see her again. The father later shared that the FBI had been able to verify the alibis of every person related to the case, except his fiance. but in this case, it might not have been possible unless security cameras were installed in the house. Agents dressed in hazmat suits arrived with more search dogs as well, and the family had to leave their home, but no significant findings were made. They removed several items from the house, such as a multicolored comforter, purple shorts, a glowworm toy, a Disney shirt, a Cars-themed blanket, rolls of tape, and a tape dispenser. Meanwhile, police received hundreds of tips, and the most intriguing came from two eyewitnesses. They claimed that on that particular night, they saw a mysterious man walking up the street with a baby in his arms, very close to the family's home on North Lister Avenue. The witnesses were actually a neighboring couple, of which the wife, also named Lisa, said that her husband was leaving for work at around 12.15 a.m., but instead of getting straight into his car, he stopped on the driveway, looking down the street at something. The wife noticed this from inside, and as it turned out, a man dressed in a white t-shirt and dark-colored pants was walking up the street carrying a baby in his arms. 
the neighbor recalled that the infant was wearing only a diaper, and the man held the baby's head to his chest as if he were protecting the child from the cold. It was shocking because I couldn't imagine anyone outside walking with their baby in the cold like that with no clothes on, the woman said. The husband waited a few minutes, and then drove off in the direction of the man, who then turned left into the garden of one of the family houses on the left side of the road, and was never seen again. The wife also said that the mysterious person looked like somebody who was accustomed to carrying a baby. It was an odd scene, but the man didn't seem to be in a hurry or suspicious in any way. He was walking at a steady pace, and that's why they thought he was a neighbor who was parked down the street at the time. In parallel with the investigation, Good Morning America managed to obtain a CCTV footage showing a man also dressed in white coming out of a wooded area in front of a British petrol gas station not far from the Irwin house around 2.30 in the morning. According to the station manager, Anuj Arora, it was unusual to see anyone walking at that time of night in the region, and unfortunately, the police haven't been able to find him yet. At the same time, they managed to track down a person who might have been the one the couple saw walking with the baby, but only one of them was able to identify him for sure, and later the police found his alibi stable. This man was John Jersey Tanko, who was kind of a neighborhood handyman and basically a homeless drifter who did odd jobs for cash and had a history of burglaries. A few weeks after the events, the handyman was put behind bars for an unrelated burglary, but in the years that have passed since then, he has also served time for various crimes. Although Jersey denied it, according to the family's lawyer, he told a teenager after the disappearance that he had kidnapped the child for $300 but later the teen denied having any conversation about that particular night with Tanko. Yet it was a very strange coincidence that the stranger turned left at the very house where John Tanko was taking care of the garden, while the Watsons, the elderly owners, were away. One Mary Hurt, a neighbor of this house, stated that she last saw Jersey at 1 p.m. on October 3rd when she left to run some errands. Hurt arrived back home at 9.30 in the evening, when she observed that the sprinkler in the garden next door was still running untouched in the same spot as in the afternoon. However, at 11 p.m., she noticed it had been turned off, presumably by John Tanko himself, and she assumed that the man known for burglaries must have been in the area around the time little Lisa disappeared. Experts gathered footprints in the muddy area the sprinkler had created, but they weren't really able to use them for much. Besides this witness account, the last confirmed sighting of Tanko prior to the disappearance was on Saturday, October 1st, when he had been kicked out of the One-Eyed Jack's bar for being so drunk, he started bullying and spitting on other guests. And his former landlord revealed that weeks before the vanishing of the baby, Tanko stopped visiting his parole officer. Jeremy Irwin also reported that three mobile phones disappeared from the kitchen counter, and one of them made a call at 11.57 p.m., on the night of the disappearance to the phone of Megan Wright, a woman who lived about a mile away from the house. The woman happened to be John Tanko's ex-girlfriend, and they had broken up just a week and a half before the child went missing. The call only lasted 50 seconds, but Wright insisted that she wasn't near her phone during that time and didn't know who called her or who answered it. What is certain is that the parents and Megan Wright did not know each other or each other's phone numbers. Bill Stanton, a New York private investigator working on the case, said, This whole case hinges on who made that call and why. We firmly believe that the person who had that cell phone also had Lisa. But this line isn't over yet. A witness who asked to remain anonymous came forward and claimed that the person who received the call was another drifter named Dane Greathouse, who was also practically homeless like Tanko, but was one of Wright's seven roommates back then. This witness stated that, Every time I was up, I saw Dane on the phone, hunched in the corner being very secretive. I would say Dane did not do anything to that baby. But as for him covering up something for a friend, that's a whole different story. Five adults and three children were living in the house, and according to Wright, the house residents told her that Dane was the one with her phone all night. She also recalled that when another roommate brought her the phone, she noticed that all the call history and messages were deleted. I went on a rant asking who had it and why my things were deleted. I got no answer, so I went back downstairs and ended up leaving the house around 3 and 4 a.m., Wright said. On the other hand, I found sources stating that a person who lived in Wright's house claimed the woman's phone wasn't some kind of community property and that they didn't share any devices. 
the parents believe that someone could have been ordered to kidnap Lisa. They think their house was being watched, and the people responsible for the abduction were waiting for the perfect opportunity, mainly because the father hardly ever worked at night, so the timing was probably not a coincidence. Worth noting that Dane himself denied any involvement in the case. He said he had used the cell phone to have his phone turned on. However, Wright contradicted these claims and said, It was not that night, a totally different day. Mid-morning, I'm not sure the date. And when asked whether it was before or after Lisa's disappearance, she said, After, if I remember correctly. And it's still not over yet because in addition to the many weird happenings, something else happened that morning as well. After the baby disappeared, the phones were stolen, and the mysterious stranger was seen walking up the street. A large fire occurred in a dumpster in a parking lot, just behind the house where John Tanko was working at. The fire was reported at an apartment complex, at 4,897 Northeast 37th Street, at 2.27 a.m., and according to the witness, the flames were shooting several feet in the air, and he believed an accelerator had been used. This also meant that someone set it on fire well before 2.27 a.m. And interestingly, Megan Wright confirmed that John Tanko previously had arson cases. She said he is a firebug and has an uncontrollable urge for him to play with fire. Later, the bin was transported for further examination, and detectives showed some burned objects to the parents, but that was all. Another weird coincidence is that the road that leads north of this parking lot actually leads to the BP gas station where the man in white was caught on camera. The description, clothing, and body structure all match that of the unidentified man walking with the baby, but also that of John Tanko. It must be highlighted that authorities questioned Tanko, Dane Greathouse, and Megan Wright too, but none of them were charged. The last relevant witness account came from a man named Mike Thompson. He told detectives that he was on his way home around 4 a.m., when he spotted a man in a t-shirt carrying a baby in his arms next to a wooded area, approximately 2.8 miles northeast of the Irwin house. According to KCPD, the person was 5 feet 7 inches tall and weighed around 140 to 150 pounds. They estimated his age to be between 30 and 40 years old, and they were really keen to talk to him, but he was never found. This sighting fits perfectly into the timeline. However, further away from this location, no one reported seeing anything similar, which may have been because the stranger could go onto the three-lane road, or even get into a car, or give the child to someone driving there. It's the easiest to disappear in such a place. Just by following this road, you can be in another state within an hour and a half, and no one will ever find you. A month after the baby's disappearance, Jeremy Irwin's debit card was stolen, and according to the father, $69.04 was charged from it and the money was used on a British website that offered online name changes for minors. Following this, somebody tried to start two more transactions, but the card had already been blocked. The police investigated the report, but they concluded it was just a routine case of card theft. The warrant and the $100,000 reward, offered by a mystery donor, are in effect to this day. The family has sent DNA samples to various databases, hoping their missing daughter does the same. Over the years, more than 80,000 flyers were printed, of which 20,000 were distributed worldwide. They moved out of the house after the tragic night and stayed with relatives nearby and only returned in mid-November. Lisa's room has not been touched since her disappearance. Everything is the same now as it was on that October night. Investigators cleared more than 700 tips and pursued 60 out-of-state leads as far as California, but none of them were fruitful. For example, police in Manhattan, Kansas, received a tip about a black car with a Missouri license plate and two women eating at a deli with a baby similar to Lisa. Eventually, investigators tracked down both of them and confirmed the child wasn't her. Officials say the biggest problem was that countless babies had the same description with the blonde hair and blue eyes and that her distinguishing beauty mark is hard to spot from a distance. In 2021, Deborah said, Our little girl is going to be 11 in November, and we don't even know what she looks like, the stuff she likes, the sound of her voice. I feel she's alive, she's out there, and eventually she's going to come home. The little girl would be 13 years old in November 2023, and police have published new images over the years of what they think she might look like. 
But despite all the efforts from the family and authorities, Lisa Irwin hasn't been found to this day, and her disappearance remains unsolved.